Lang and Jesse Vandermeer. And we're looking forward to doing another webcast and updating our clients on what's going on in the market and also talking about some of the companies that uh, we are investing in. We call this uh, our QE to Queasy to QE webcast. Now, I encourage you a couple of, uh, a couple of things. Let me just uh, to point out to you. Number one, at the bottom of this uh, webcast, you can click on the presentation that we're going to walk you through, and that's helpful. And we'll, from time to time, go back and forth to that presentation. The second item is to look on our website, and you can ask us for it if you send in an email. Uh, our latest quarterly update, which also has quite a bit of the information that we're going to talk about um, today. So let's just launch right into it in terms of the presentation. The first slide that uh, will come up if you are looking through the presentation is a disclaimer slide. We always have to cover all of our legal issues and regulatory issues, so I encourage you to look at that. The next slide is a really an outline of the presentation that we're going to be walking you through and uh, a quick just a review of our investment philosophy, looking at the investment challenges out there, zeroing in really on what um, this presentation is all about in terms of the front end of the presentation, and that is the whole issue of interest rates and the expansion of the money supply. We want to really just highlight a couple of important things there and how that impacts how we're investing uh, our client's portfolio and protecting your capital. We'll just mention very quickly a little bit about a performance uh, summary, performance update, and then we're going to swing over to looking at two companies. Uh, Jesse's going to talk about Brookfield Infrastructure, and Andrew's going to talk about Exylum. And these are two companies that we've owned for quite some time and uh, are good representatives of the kind of businesses we want to own in this environment in order to protect and grow investors' capital. Now, I'm going to quickly just go over to the presentation. So we'll, we'll just put that on the screen for you. And um, there we go. Just one second. My technology skills. And then we share that. There we go. And so let me just page through the disclaimer a little bit about the presentation. Um, Rocklink, in terms of a quick update, founded back in 2010, we're about 136 million now and about 120 households. Um, what we want to emphasize just on this slide again is we want to be independent thinking. Our industry is really dominated by just follow what everyone else is doing um, or index investing, passive investing, all of that. Um, we want to be active investors and very thoughtful about how we're going about that so we can add value to our clients. The investment philosophy is we always highlight, I always want to emphasize this to people, buying great companies. You're going to hear about two of those in a few moments. We focus our portfolio so we're not all over the place and diluting our best ideas, uh, nor investing in too many companies that we cannot follow and understand well. We want to hold those companies for as long as possible so that we can tax defer and compound wealth, which is critical for long-term success. And then be very careful about what we pay. So buy at a margin of safety, be attentive to valuations. And then this last issue, which we're really a zero in on today in particular, is understand the economic backdrop that we're operating in. You just can't buy an, a, an investment without understanding what's going on in the context of that investment. And so that's what we want to talk a little bit about today. Um, the investment challenges, as we've highlighted before, is debt, debt, and more debt. Uh, the debt is out is just outrageous, really, when you think about the global debt. We talked a little bit about this last uh, in our last presentation, and we talk about it all the time because it is one of the biggest issues that we're facing as investors. $250 trillion globally in debt. Government promises, governments continue to promise more and more. In fact, we'll talk a little bit about the fact that there's more and more pressure on governments to get involved even more in the economy as if they're not already involved in too many things. The demographics are plaguing many jurisdictions around the world, um, particularly to Europe, Japan, China, aging populations, lack of family formation, and we put this in here, really the undermining of public education. It's, it's fair to say that this generation of students coming out of our public institutions has probably never been more misinformed and lacking an understanding of how the world really does work and should work. 
Um, and then monetary policies, which we'll talk about in particular today, this printing of money and record low interest rates. That's what we mean about and when we talk about quantitative easing. That's when you lower interest rates and you print money, you just add money digitally to the system. And, uh, and then we've gone through that phase. They tried to tighten up a little bit of that in the United States and Canada. So we call that quantitative tightening. Last fall, investors will realize what happened. It created a very sick feeling we call queasy. Um, the market really rebelled. The market rebelled against any kind of tightening of interest rates and a reduction in the money supply. And so what happened in the first quarter of this year is we went right back to printing money again um, and uh, easing up on interest rates, saying that uh, interest rates won't actually go up. And we saw this just yesterday, the ECB said no interest rate increases. And I was just watching an interview this morning from Larry Kudlow, who's the um, on the finance team with, uh, with President Trump. And he said, in his view, they'll, we'll never see interest rate increases in his lifetime. Now, he's an older guy, maybe he's not gonna live much longer, but uh, I think his point is, it's gonna be very difficult to put interest rates up. And so we wanna just highlight and talk a little bit about that before we look at the companies. Um, the next slide here, key implications um, in impacting our investment decisions. Uh, the first point there is what I, I really just highlighted it's going to be virtually impossible to get out of this without a problem. Um, in other words, the debt is so large, there's no way interest rates can increase materially without causing a funding problem and entering, uh, bringing economies into recession. Uh, it's impossible, as I say, to raise interest rates back to ethical normality. Uh, what I mean by that is interest rates should reflect uh, the risk of the investment time value of money should protect you from some inflation, but with the interest rates where they're at today, and uh, that's virtually zero to negative in many areas of the world, you're losing purchasing power day after day after day after day. Um, and so your money really is becoming increasingly worth less. Um, so what do we do? We wanna buy tangible assets, essential scarce businesses. We're gonna talk about a couple of those today where you can really buy into businesses that are absolutely necessary. They have fantastic assets and they'll give us the best opportunity to protect capital over time. Maintain a healthy exposure to monetary substitutes like gold and silver because over time they do uh, protect you from erosion of uh, inflation and deflation and all the issues that can come as a result of loose monetary policy and then have some firepower. In other words, we're always keeping a little bit of money on the side that we can quickly put into the markets when they get really choppy. Now, just where I'm going to finish up here is I'm just going to make a couple of points in regards to low interest rates. I find it um, somewhat um, upsetting, if you will, if uh, when, I, when, I, when I listen to people talk about how great it is to have low interest rates. Well, to a certain degree, that's true, but when interest rates become abnormally low, or there virtually is no interest rate, or as we see in Europe and in China, not China, Japan, negative interest rates, that's a sign of a sick economy, not a healthy economy, and that should concern all long-term investors, and it certainly concerns us. So let me just draw, I'll draw out a couple of points here. I've just got seven here. I'm going to go through very quickly. You can look at them at your leisure later. Um, I outline nine in our latest report, but these are things that you're not going to hear from an economist. You're not going to hear from your, you know, get from your 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 your, your economic textbook, but these are critically important issues. So number one, what's the problem with low interest rates? Low interest rates encourage a culture of instant gratification. A debt-based society is more interested in consumption than long-term economic growth. And we see that all around us. People are just consumed with debt and uh, spending money. And that's part of the problem that's emerged is we got so much debt, you can't even put interest rates up. Second, low interest rates punish savers. And so it's really a tax on wealth because you can't make a return on your investments. So the savers subsidize the debtors. And this leads to um, long-term capital misallocation. And that means lower returns. Three, the combination of low interest rates and printed money leads to a massive asset price inflation. All I'm going to point out here is that 
If you look at the last 15, 20 years, the value of homes, and real estate, value of stocks have gone up a lot faster than income levels. And so what's happened is all this printing of money, low interest rates, the acquisition of debt, forward spending without having the money to uh, really uh, pay for things has led to uh, a pricing of uh, real assets that are that is gone up significantly. So it's making it very difficult for young people to actually enter and even buy a home on the basis of the incomes that they earn. So that's the kind of inflation that we've seen that no one really talks about. And when you look at the CPI levels, these, these consumer price indexes, they just don't even factor this in. And yet uh, I would say the standard of living for young people today, you know, the 25 year olds coming out of university has dropped in half from what it was 25, 30 years ago. There's no question about that when you look at the real estate market alone. Uh, number four, human behavior shaped by, in, in a negative way by low interest rates. It, uh, it means again, it takes away thrift, frugality. Uh, people become increasingly happy with debt. They see it just as a rational choice. Um, and uh, that leads to further problems. And then fifth, the debasement of money leads to the debasement of manufacturing production quality. Um, what I would just say here quickly because of time, values and virtues cannot be compartmentalized. So lack of values in economics, where you just spend, 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 print money, cheapen the value of money, create inflation in certain areas. It's ultimately a reflection of a lack of personal morality and values in the broader population. And so when we see the problems in our economic realm, it's really telling us that there's a lot of ethical and moral problems in the personal realm amongst the cultural issues. So economics is just a reflection of the people ultimately in the society. And so when you have a society that's dominated by easy money policies, it's telling you that people are um, not really thinking um, with the kind of values necessary to drive long-term economics. And uh, certainly that's true if you look at our, our, our country or around the world. Um, six, incentives for fiscal discipline on the part of governments decrease dramatically. All I'm going to say here is, look, if you give the governments low interest rates and you allow them to print money through their central banks, governments will be financially irresponsible to the power of 10. And that's what we see everywhere. Governments are out of control when it comes to spending everywhere around the world. And that eventually will put at risk the value of our investments. So we have to be very careful. And then unjust, and seventhly, unjust redistribution of wealth takes place in an environment of zero rates and fresh money printing. So monetary expansion, when you print money, is never neutral. It, it actually creates a wealth transfer to the people that get their hands on it first. And so these are issues that um, we highlight because when, we, and when everyone gets excited about all these interest rates going down, they're not really looking at what the long-term implication is. And then let me just finish with this in terms of my part of the presentation. This QE to QEZE, you know, feeling sick and then back to printing more money and keeping interest rates low, has really been le leading more and more to the socialism, increased, increased focus on the government getting involved in every part of our life. And so if you're listening to the news, you're starting to think, well, what, what am I hearing when I'm, when I'm listening to these people talk in terms of uh, economic policies? Increasingly, you're hearing about helicopter money. That means the, you know, the bank just continues, the central bank continues to print money and just drops money into areas of the economy where the politicians think it should go. Um, so if there's wealth disparities, we can make up those wealth disparities, just print the money. And, uh, and this is unbelievable to hear this coming out of... Uh, uh, there are schools coming out of our different politicians and so forth. The second point I'd make is the Japification of Europe first and then North America. What do I mean by that? You're also, if you're, if you're paying attention to the news carefully, you're hearing about Japan as a 300% you know, debt to GDP ratio in terms of their, their uh, government debt. It, it's just huge. Our situation is maybe 100, 110 in the United States. And what people are saying more and more is, hey, Japan can, Japan's running triple the level of debt at the government level. Why can't we? Why can't we do that? And so you're seeing the errors of Japan and the problems that uh, they've been going through since really 1989 when their stock market hit the high. Um, now they're suggesting, why don't we go down the same road? Why don't we go down the same road of stagnation 
and no and no growth in our economy and this this will be just fine some refer to this as you know mon mon modern monetary theory um, you know, my point is we need to be careful when we're listening to people come up with these crazy, insane ideas on how we can just continue to print money and go further into debt and it won't be an issue. The third issue that uh, I mentioned here that you're probably hearing more about is this whole implementation of a universal income benefit where everybody should have a basic income level regardless of whether they work or not. Um, and this is a big concern also. We don't have the time to go into all the reasons for that, but of course people are responsible for working. There should not be any, any pay for someone who's able to work and doesn't work. Um, this is a moral and ethical issue and paying people for not working would absolutely be um, devastating to the economy long term and to uh, people's value and the integrity of work. Uh, in the economy. So that's another issue that you'd be concerned about. And then fourth, a grossly misinformed and uneducated population uh, driven by envy and selfish rights. We hear this day in and day out if you're listening to the news rather than what are our responsibilities as citizens and what about a work ethic? And so what I'd say here is what we've done over the last 20, 30 years with all this debt printing of money, lowering interest rates year after year after year after year, is you've created a really dependent uh, economy on the central banks. And it's turning back now on a war on capital. Whoever has capital, um, they're, they're, they're tending to go after it more and more. And so when we look at that, we say our focus must be on wealth protection. How are we going to protect our clients' money? How are we going to buy businesses and assets that can weather this just increasing pressure that we see all around in terms of depreciating the value of our money, keeping interest rates low, um, and inflationary pressures um, bubbling up all around us. And so we want to really focus on assets that will protect us. Um, our performance summary as of the end of March, I'll just put this up here quickly. This is really our overall book of business, which is about 68% equity, 30, 32% bond, short-term cash. And um, that's after all fees and expenses, and you can look at that. And then I've just put up our 100% equity weighting. So if you look just at our stocks, how they've done vis-a-vis -vis the TSX and the S&P 500. So we've uh, done very well um, in terms of that, in terms of our record and performance. So with that, I want to swing over now to these companies. Um, look at the companies. Jesse's going to talk about Brookfield Infrastructure Partners and the whole uh, point of this is to is to get back and look at the companies that are tangible, the real businesses, and given all of the challenges around us and really just monetary insanity to a certain degree, given what's going on and what's what continues to just be spending, 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 no no interest rates and printing money. How are we going to act in that environment? How are we going to do our best to? Uh, protect those assets. So I'm going to swing it over to uh, Jesse now. You met Jesse in the last uh, webcast. Jesse's one of the research analysts and focuses on a number of industries and one of those is the area of infrastructure where we have some, some of our uh, largest investments. In fact, Brookfield Infrastructure I think would be our actually our largest investment across our whole group. So Jesse, uh, take it from here. Thanks Jonathan. Um, as Jonathan mentioned, the first company we're going to look at is Brookfield Infrastructure Infrastructure Partners. Um, it's involved uh, in the infrastructure asset space. Um, the whole space of in infrastructure investing has evolved over the past 15 or 20 years. It has moved from select institutional investors to a, a much wider and broad investor base. Um, infrastructure assets are typically these real or physical assets. They, they provide essential services critical to the functioning of our modern economy. Some of these assets include toll roads, airports, seaports, uh, utilities, pipelines. Uh, we, we utilize these assets every day, either directly or indirectly. And again, they are essential to the functioning uh, of our economy. We're attracted to these assets uh, for various reasons. They share some similar characteristics. These include inflation hedge cash flows, uh, high barriers to en entry, monopolistic-like assets, um, they have lower correlation to financial markets, and they typically have stable revenue profiles, which are underpinned by long-term contracts, which provide a steady base for a, a payout and a healthy distribution. 
going on to um, the next slide, I'll actually uh, we'll we'll throw up the slides here that you so that you can follow along. I'll be covering some numbers here, so it, it might be easier if you you can see these slides in front of you. Um, on on the next slide that we have um, for Brookfield, we'll look at the company itself. Um, BIP, uh, as Brookfield is Infrastructure Partners is known colloquially, is the owner and operator of critical infrastructure networks over which energy, goods, people, and data flow. They oversee $37 billion in assets across five continents. So they're truly a global player. And this is also one characteristic which helps set Brookfield apart and then gives them a competitive edge. In, they operate through four segments. The first one is utilities. Um, they have a $4.5 billion rate base, meaning they can earn regulated uh, rates of return on $4.5 billion. They have 2,000 kilometers of natural gas pipelines in Brazil, 2,200 kilometers of electricity transmission in both North and South America. And they've recently, in the past year, have been awarded 2,700 kilometers of additional transmission lines um, that they can de develop through greenfield uh, development um, by recent government auctions in Brazil. So they're definitely building out that business there. Moving on to their second segment, transportation. They have 4,200 kilometers of toll roads in Brazil, Peru, and India, 37 shipping ports uh, across three continents, and over 10,000 kilometers of railroads in Australia and South America, moving goods, minerals, and ore. Uh, transportation in particular uh, benefits from economies of scale as increased volume uh, can flow right to the bottom line. In the third segment, energy, um, this segment is largely uh, located in North America. They have 15,000 natural gas uh, kilometers of natural gas pipelines, and this includes the recent acquisition they made of Enbridge's Western uh, Canada gathering pipelines. They have 13 natural gas processing plants and 600 billion cubic feet of storage. So again, these are very large numbers. Brookfield, uh, with its size, is able to execute on uh, very large deals. And in the last segment, we have data. Uh, they operate uh, and own 7,000 cell towers, 5,500 kilometers of fiber connections, and 33 data centers. This segment is a relatively newer segment for Brookfield. And it also highlights how data infrastructure is just as important as uh, other physical infrastructure that we uh, know today. Looking at distribution and total returns, uh, Brookfield has performed very well over the past decade as a public partnership. Um, going through some numbers, if you look at the average trading price of $7.50 in 2008, its first year of trading as a partnership, they had a dividend of 71 cents per share, which generated a dividend yield of 9.46%. Now, based on this year, uh, 2019's projected distribution of $2.01, the yield investors are currently receiving on their initial equity investment in 2008 is approximately 27%, which is outstanding. Div BIP's dividend has grown at around 10% over the e over the past 10 years. So it's a very strong uh, distribution and you can see that uh, amazing yield that you receive on your initial investment there in 2008. Put it another way, the cumulative unadjusted dividends paid out over the years is just shy of $20, which means on the average trading price of $750, um, depending on what point in the year you take that stock price, there's been a dividend return over 300%. And you see that highlighted in the 10 year returns. Um, the total return over the past 10 years or since inception has been 667%, which is outstanding, particularly, particularly for a, a business like infrastructure, which is very steady. Also interesting is noting the price return of 358% and the dividend return of 309%, uh, both very strong and uh, the price return, BIP would pay out around 60 to 70% of its cash flow. So the fact that the price return is in the range that it is, is outstanding. BIP has uh, generated um, fantastic returns and a total 
annualized total return of 22%. This is well in excess of the market's long-term return. And then speaking again to uh, Brookfield's ability to generate high returns, this has to do in part with capital recycling. So the fantastic part about the Brookfield family uh, in general is that you get to access within one holding a portfolio of assets, which is actively managed. So they'll often recycle their assets, just meaning they'll sell fully matured assets at very high prices, and they can take that those proceeds and recycle them into higher opportunities, higher return opportunities. So noting some acquisitions, um, you can see in Brazil, they've made acquisitions in the data center, toll roads, and gas transmission assets. Uh, Brazil can have quite a bit of a volatile economic cycle, and they'll pick away at the troughs in the econo economic cycle down there, and they can get these assets for very reasonable, um, reasonable amounts. Uh, going company specific, uh, specific they've uh, recently acquired Enbridge's Western Canadian midstream assets. Enbridge had to delever or sell assets to um, reduce its debt load, and BIP um, bought its Western Canadian midstream assets, again, for a very reasonable price, taking advantage, advantage of Enbridge's need to sell some assets. And lastly, um, they've been uh, for some time looking at the Indian cell tower market. The industry over there um, is what they're looking to take advantage of. The industry is being consolidated, which means highly indebted Indian telecom operators do need to reduce their debt levels, meaning they'll sell these very attractive cell tower assets and BIP is likely to uh, step in and buy some at very reasonable prices. And lastly, some divestitures. This is highlighting the fact that BIP recycles these assets, fully mature assets in mature markets, typically for very, uh, very high prices, often multiples of capital that they deployed. Uh, in Chilean toll roads, uh, this was an investment that they've held over the past decade from the very beginning. Um, the Chilean economy um, has been very strong in the context of the whole Latin America, and they were able to sell these toll roads um, for very reasonable prices. And lastly, uh, the Ontario electricity transmission assets, they were able to generate $300 million of proceeds and also generate an IRR of 20%. So again, this just highlights BIP's ability to recycle these assets and drive higher returns. Okay, thank you very much, Jesse. I had a couple of questions at the end, but just to swing over and have Andrew talk a little bit about another really important industry, and that would be the water industry, one that uh, provides great opportunities for some investments. So, Andrew, I take it from here, sir. Great. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, water is an essential commodity. It plays a fundamental role in the economy. The water industry has been facing many significant challenges. However, with these challenges comes great opportunity for investment. Uh, one of the challenges that many cities face is an aging water infrastructure. In the US, there's an estimated 1.6 million miles of water and wastewater pipes across the country. Um, by 2020, the average age of this infrastructure is estimated to be about 45 years old. An aging water infrastructure can lead to structural deterioration of its water distribution system. This can lead to great problems. For instance, the American Water Works Association estimates that there is over 200,000 water main breaks per year. If you add up all of the water, that is about over 2 trillion gallons of wasted, treated water that's uh, inefficient and leads to financial loss. Another issue that many cities face is storm water overflow. Um, some cities have combined sewage and storm water sewer, sewer, sewage systems. When there is heavy rainfall, um, some of these systems cannot uh, have the capacity to manage such a large amount of water. This untreated water therefore flows into rivers and streams and leads to contamination. Another issue that uh, the water industry faces is managing energy consumption. Water uh, and wastewater treatment facilities require a substantial amount of energy. 
According to the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, um, energy costs can account for 25 to 30 percent of a water utility's uh, maintenance and operational costs. Now, with all of these challenges, um, the water industry is looking to smart water technology to address these inefficiencies. Now, what is smart water technology? Uh, smart water technology incorporates smart intelligent systems, software, and applications with water infrastructure assets. This data can then be uh, collected and monitored instantaneously in real time. Um, this data can then be analyzed using algorithms, which can be used to help operators with um, providing them actionable insights to uh, monitor their infrastructure uh, conditions, can be used to proactively prevent um, issues from occurring. Operators can respond in real time, and it, you know, it can also help with um, providing predictive scheduling maintenance. Um, one of the companies that we believe is a leader within the water industry is a company called Xylem. Now, Xylem uh, develops highly uh, specialized engineered um, water technology. It's a leading pure play technology company. Um, that is able to address many of the complex water challenges. Uh, the company designs um, infrastructure applications and technologies for the utility industry. About half of the company's business is in this space. Um, the industrial space accounts for 35% of its business, while the remaining uh, goes to commercial and residential. Now, Xylem's products are used across the entire water cycle. They, de they develop energy efficient water pumps that are used in water intake from water sources such as lakes and rivers to transport of water to treatment facilities and residential, commercial, industrial locations. They develop filtration and disinfection technology and analytical instrumentation that's used in treating and testing water and wastewater. The company also develops uh, industry-specific applications for various industries, such as the oil and gas, food and beverage, mining, agriculture, and life sciences. Now, over the past five years, the company has made focused investments and acquisitions to develop a network of smart water technology. One of its recent acquisitions is a company called Peer Technologies, which previously traded on the TSX. Um, this company is a leader in leak detection and condition assessment solutions for water distribution networks, it develops smart infrastructure assessment and diagnostic solutions that can be used to monitor and detect leaks from pipes that are buried underground. Uh, we believe this strengthens Xylem's position and offering to address the challenges of an aging water infrastructure. Now, there are many reasons why we like Xylem's growth story. The company has developed a strong reputation for developing high quality and reliable products that address emerging water issues. Uh, they develop a highly engineered and specialized solutions that cannot be easily commoditized, and this creates uh, higher customer switching costs. It also has developed a large install base, and this enables the company to have a steady recurring revenue from replacement parts, maintenance, and software. Um, it also has developed a growing presence in emerging markets. And lastly, uh, we believe the, the management team is focused allocators of capital. Um, they invest smart uh, water uh, infrastructure that can be addressed these issues managing uh, sewer overflow challenges, reducing wasted resources, and maximizing energy efficiency. And this has translated into strong results. So as you see, from 2013 to 2018, adjusted EBITDA uh, increased 13%. Adjusted operating margin ex uh, margins expanded 190 basis points uh, to 13.7%. And free cash flow has grown 12% uh, 
each year from 2013 to 2018. Thank you very much, Andrew. A couple quick questions in terms of water, and then I'm going to just uh, going to ask uh, Jesse a couple questions when he goes back to infrastructure. One of the things that um, we see, and you mentioned it in the presentation in terms of Exylum, is the smart technology and the fact that they're not just selling pipes and valves anymore. They're actually um, having an increasing revenue coming from software sales, which is really a, a fee-based revenue. And we why is that important in terms of the business model and what we're looking at uh, when it comes to some of the water investments? Sure. So we're starting to see um, this integration now of hard water assets with software. And what's great is once a capital resource has been installed, we have this recurring revenue base from its software. Um, we have analytical um, data analytics software um, that helps operators be able to detect um, issues on the spot in real time. And this is a monthly and uh, yearly recurring revenue base. Um, if you have pipes and, and uh, filtration systems installed, that's all, that's a one-time uh, yeah. revenue source. Whereas by having this integration of software, we're starting to see this recurring revenue base through software uh, as a service um, model. Yeah, makes it, makes it really a, a better business. And uh, when you have a software business, the margins are much higher, and it also embeds them, so it's harder to get harder to get rid of them. You're going to be using them more and more for replacement parts, and as as the whole system ages, we've owned Exylum going back to when it was spun out um, back in 2013 from ITT. It was part of a larger conglomerate, and what caught our attention way back then was we really are looking at this water industry. It's, it's, the most important industry. The water is probably one of the most underpriced commodities, and uh, and yet it's really in demand. And there's such scarcity of fresh potable water around the world. Um, one of the questions that came in to us just to, on the net there was: it, Are there other water investments that you have in terms of Rocklink? And yes, we do have some investments in American Water, which is a utility. We also have some in Ecolab, which is an industrial water company in terms of cleaner, you know, helping clean water, or recycle water in the oil and gas industry and things like that. And a company like Pentair, which is involved more in the retail water market. So it's an important area for us to um, continue to invest because you go back to the first part of the presentation. Water is essential. Nothing's going to operate very long without a uh, fresh uh, water supply. And, uh, and so that kind of business can reprice, protect us over the long term from the erosion of purchasing power and some of the, uh, some of the crazy things that governments are doing or central banks are doing around the world with uh, all of the printing of money. So we're going to swing over to uh, Jesse and go back to, uh, to BIP, um, Brookfield Infrastructure. Um, you mentioned recycling, and, uh, it, and it's important to us. When we're looking at a business um, like a, an infrastructure company, a lot of times people say, well, an infrastructure company, oh, you're just going to buy this one asset, you're going to sit on it, and then you're going to collect a, a coupon, you're going to collect a revenue stream. What we really like about Brookfield, and the, there's a whole group of these Brookfield assets, Brookfield Asset Management, and then they have a number of companies underneath, them, including BIP, uh, Brookfield Infrastructure, is they buy and they sell infrastructure assets. So... Um, that's really what Jesse was talking about, which makes it a dynamic infrastructure company. They're constantly keeping their portfolio fresh and in the very best investment. So um, Jesse, when he pointed out that recycling, um, it's really important to understand what that means. Is That means you've got an active, managed portfolio by the Brookfield team. And so they'll take advantage of lows in Brazil. When Jesse was talking about Brazil, I mean, Brazil just got slammed the last couple of years. Valuations were low, 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 but they know that market. They've been there for over 100 years, so they can go in and buy low. Um, and then over time, as it gets better, then they can monetize or sell those assets and drive up return. One of the things that, uh, one of the questions that came in, Jesse, maybe you could just talk about uh, quickly, is that uh, we're in this idea of everything has to be green um, and environmentalism and so forth. And we're obviously concerned about proper environmental uh, behavior and stewardship of assets. Are there some other infrastructure investments that we are involved in that are a bit more, say, in the green space? Um, and uh, maybe we could just talk just quickly about that because uh, we like that area also from an infrastructure perspective. 
For sure. Uh, within Brookfield infrastructure itself, uh, they do hold uh, dams in Colombia and uh, Brazil. But we also, within the Brookfield family itself, we also, our second largest holding uh, is Brookfield Renewable Partners. So uh, while Brookfield infrastructure actually do hold green assets, hydroelectric uh, dams and so forth, in Brookfield Renewable uh, Partners, it's uh, the world's largest uh, renewable operator. Um, and that is also a very large holding uh, within our client portfolios as well. And uh, Brookfield likes to pride itself on saying that they were uh, in the green space before it became Vogue to do so. Uh, I know CEO Bruce Flatt uh, talks about that um, and they've definitely been there a long time. They've recently moved into solar as well as the uh, economies uh, move in, in the favor of uh, asset management there. So. Uh, they definitely do hold those. Uh, we do have that exposure to kind of the green uh, infrastructure assets there. And one of the things, just to mention quickly, when you're dealing with these large infrastructure companies that have to cozy up to governments and they have very tight relationships with uh, um, different bodies around the world, um, as we saw with the SNC Lavalon, that's very topical in Canada. Um, you know, none of these companies are perfect and they often get into arrangements with governments when they have to do long-term contracts and stuff like that. But we feel pretty good about Brookfield. Brookfield has a very good history and is very careful about how they do business, what countries they go into. Um, no, co no company, of course, is perfect, um, but their history is one that sets them apart as very, very ethical, very honest in how we do their deals. And that's important to us as investors also, and to you, because we don't want to wake up one morning and find out that uh, they're on the front page of the globe for the wrong reasons. Brookfield, and uh, as Jesse mentioned, Bruce Flatt are, is an exceptionally well-run company, and uh, they really are able to buy, buy, buy low and then sell high in terms of all the different businesses. And one of the things, that just last point, when we go back to what we talked about at the beginning and trying to protect ourselves from the erosion of capital because we are in this market where interest rates are low which favors infrastructure companies um, who uh, are, are borrowing um, on their balance sheet to buy long-term assets but also maybe we could just mention how they protect us from inflation because that's also uh, part of this whole scenario that we're involved in now with central banks not lifting interest rates and going back to you know increasing the money supply. This is a big issue. This is a big concern for investors. How do you protect the purchasing power of your money? Um, and uh, maybe just answer that quickly in terms of the how the infrastructure companies at least help sure. um, sort of moderate that risk. Yeah, as a large operator, they're in many different countries and they have to operate through many different currencies. Um, there's a number of ways that they're able to protect themselves. Um, particularly in emerging market economies where inflation might be a much higher risk. Um, they, first of all, they, uh, they actually finance their assets in the yeah, currency of the market that they're in. So we do not have to be so worried about translating it back to U.S. dollars or so forth. They actually finance the asset uh, using domestic capital markets and um, they'll protect themselves that way. Also, for example, the cash flows are inflation hedged. So if you have a dam and you are selling energy from that, the, whatever the inflation in the country is, they'll, uh, in their contracts, say that wherever the inflation moves to, they'll sell um, their uh, assets or the cash flow streams uh, that is linked to that. So they also protect themselves in that way as well. And then as a corporate uh, organization, they, they will choose to hedge uh, if it's economical um, in, in various currencies so they can manage it that way. So there's three there's three main ways that they are able to protect um, the cash flows from inflation moves. Yeah, that's good. Okay, well, we've probably gone a little longer than uh, we originally planned, but as you can tell, we're, we're, we're pumped about our investments. We like what we're doing. We are, we just do, we do have major concerns and we want to be um, as careful as possible um, with investments, the kind of companies that we're buying and not be naive about the world that we live in. Low interest rates forever is not a good thing for, for the capital markets long term. It might be a bit of a narcotic now, but uh, long term, we if we don't put proper price on money and we're not disciplined in terms of how um, we add money to the, to the market, how we spend and our debt levels, 
then uh, it's going to put more risk on capital and capital values. And it's going to mean that we want to be even more conservative and more careful about how we're investing so that we can continue to uh, make a steady progress in terms of your investments. The next webcast is uh, scheduled for June the 13th. We thought we'd get one more in before the summer period. And uh, if you have questions, uh, email, call, um, let us know. And uh, we appreciate your support and uh, we appreciate uh, all of our clients and also our colleagues. And uh, if you have, uh, if you want us to review your investments, then just let us know and uh, we're right here and willing to do that. Thank you very much. Have a good rest of the day. Bye now.